Hello humans, I hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, welcome to a new episode of Psicoactivo. Today, I am going to take you through a timeline of what's been happening on my end in terms of the Nazca mummies case. To be clear, it is not the Nazca mummies. Yesterday, Matt Ford at the Good Trouble show had Dr. Richard O'Connor and Dr. O'Connor released a, a scientific paper that investigates uh, these mummies, the, the ones that are like the size of humans. And he made it clear that they are not mummies. They are desiccated corpses because they still have their organs inside of them. A couple of things of this, I am glad and thank you to Matt Ford Thank you to the Good Trouble Show for uh, taking the time to investigate this topic. I know it took them long enough because there's been a lot of obfuscation in the case since 2017. This happened because uh, there were researchers, uh, English speaking researchers, who went to Mexico and tried to investigate the mummies and uh, to my knowledge, they weren't shown the real evidence. They were shown something else. Uh, I'm not going to name names or anything because I don't think that's productive. And I know that uh, I've been very vocal about uh, how insulting this whole case and this landering has been to both Mexican and Peruvian scientists who have done the same exact tests with the evidence they had because they had the bodies and they were slandered there was there was a hit piece documentary from tmc uh there have been multiple slanderous comments against the case and although i understand that the comments were mainly against mr jaime mausan i also want these people to understand that these slanderous comments and honestly, a little bit out of place, uh, out of school, as someone I've heard say before, they have been, without thinking about these scient scientists and professionals. And yes, I wrote to Dr. Gary Nolan because uh, let me show you this clip of Dr. Gary Nolan speaking to Matt Ford during the live stream yesterday. Uh, which officially proves that Dr. Nolan is a man of his word. I'll explain to you after this clip. I, on my signal, Dr. Gary Nolan uh, just uh, pinged, and he says, uh, Matt, this presentation is amazing. Again, this is Dr. Gary Nolan of Stanford University, the executive director of the Soul Foundation. Uh, and, and he was... Uh, 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 <laughs> and he says, I don't want to come on. I was going to ask him if he wants to come on the air, but he says he looks like shit today. So, uh, uh, so he's, he's just going to text, text these questions, but, the, so the, do I, but yeah, so yeah. Uh, well, you should see me without a suit. I totally look uh, horrible. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah. So Dr. Nolan says, uh, Matt, this presentation is amazing. Clearly he's very impressed. Uh, he was noted, noting here that, that there seem to be two different types. He, he notes here, the small ones seem very different than the other one that is crouched over. Are these two species? Uh, yeah, um, in fact, they, they've described three, as far as I know, three different uh, separate species of these mummies that were all discovered in this same um, repository of these body or corpses really is what they are they're they're not really mummies you know they're corpses right uh, because they're they have all of their internal organs that are highly desiccated and and fairly difficult to to figure out what you're looking at but um you know as far as their interior organ structures but um yeah they um they have discovered three different species that i'm aware of uh all of them are, are quite different than one another so yeah. Do, do, yeah, Dr. Nolan was was noting that the brain cases are very different uh, between the two. So is it is it a uh, when no. when when he says that the brain cases are different is the the inter the internal volume of the brain casing 
different in size or is it more of, of just the shape of it? Or, and would, and would that indicate uh, a difference in, in age of, of the different, different ones? So, um, so I don't know if, you, if you're referencing these two that that are juxtaposed here in the slide on the left, or if he's talking about comparing like Josefina here in the foreground on, on the left to Maria, who is a much different, um, you know, humanoid, um, humanoid specimen. Uh, but yeah, yeah I mean, that the, the sizes of these are way different. These are, these little smaller ones are about 60 centimeters long. And the Mario, I think, was like 1.68 meters long. So she's about the size of a average human female. Okay. These are very small. These are, let's say, two feet, two feet long. You know. So yeah, they're way, way different. Uh, Dr. Nolan was asking. He noted earlier, just kind of going back to uh, to what to his uh, message here. He was saying that the that. He says uh, they seem to be two different types. The small ones seem very different than the one that is crouched over. So I think perhaps he's talking about the one that was uh, that appeared that was going through the CT scan. Oh, uh, and and also oh, yes. a, no a, yes. a, a note from Dr. Nolan as well is it possible these beings were of a came from a different a caste system per se. Uh, it's absolutely possible. Sure. I have no idea what their hierarchy of, um, you know, this is going to be something that anthropologists and sociologists, um, you know, this one reason that the journal that picked this, this article up is because that's the kind of, of things that this particular journal that's, pro that's produced in Brazil, these are the kind of questions that they address, uh, in their journal is the sort of, um, social and environmental consequences of discoveries like this and what and what they could mean. And so I think that that's a reason that this particular uh, journal picked up this this article and peer reviewed it and published it. So the reason I say Dr. Nolan is a man of his word is because uh, when I interviewed Jaime Maussan back in October, I reached out to Dr. Nolan to his email and told him about the, the case and everything. Asked him if he would be willing to get on the case and investigate it because I have I know the first time I ever saw Dr. Nolan was in that documentary with Dr. Stephen Greer where he investigated the Atacama alien. And I kept hope that Dr. Nolan would be willing to get on the case, but in his response to me, it was very clear that he didn't want the press involved. And I understand that because scientists love doing their investigations in private. That's the best way to get to the, uh, to get to prove anything scientifically in the fastest possible way, because you guys need to understand the scientific method is slow, tends to be slow. The peer review process is slow because it needs to go through different groups of scientists who can produce the same results of the same experiment. And that's why it takes so long. That's the reason any scientist who talks about any case that is either controversial or difficult will always be skeptical because if there is no proven evidence of any claim in any case they're obviously going to say there's not enough evidence we need to investigate that that is completely understandable and i know there's a lot of people who have been going at dr michael masters and i think that is completely unfair because during their most recent interview he did on that UFO podcast although he maintained his uh, stance on the mummies that they're fake he did say that he doesn't have and he hasn't seen uh, enough evidence if any because he saw very limited evidence and that is the reason he maintains this stance and that is logical whoever wants to go at him and uh, 
bombard him on DMs. I think they're doing themselves a disservice because Dr. Masters is just being honest. He's just uh, talking about what he's seen so far. Uh, and I completely understand that he was disenchanted by uh, the vitriol and slanderous comments or aggressive comments against him just for giving his opinion. So I would like to, I'm, I mean, I, he already told Patrick from Vetted that he's not going to touch the case anymore. And I completely understand. I just think it's really unfortunate because... Uh, if he had a chance to look at all the data that is coming out, I think he would be one of the people who can turn this around and potentially prove something uh, different than what ha has already been said. Um, I think that this case is just opened up. What was discovered and talked about over the last weekend does not mean that the mummies are real. It just means that there is enough evidence to keep investigating the case and we're finally getting traction from the English speaking researchers, journalists and scientists. And that's good news. That's the way we have to look at it. But I am speaking from first-hand experience talking to the people involved with the mummies case in Mexico and Peru. Uh, I've been speaking to Joyce Mantilla, who is the Peruvian journalist who's on this case and has the most uh, reliable evidence on it. And I, I know accounts from Dr. Salce Benitez, who was at the Mexican hearing, and they both are utterly disappointed. There's this case of what Professor Stephen Brown told me about in his interview, but he also said this before me, before he spoke to me, he also told this to Toby at the Roswell Daily Record during their interview. He used a term called epistemic injustice. And I am going to play you a fairly long clip about this, and then we'll break it down. Here's the clip. I wanted to ask you because uh, you used the term uh, during the interview with uh, Toby. Yeah. Um, what was the term again about the, um, it's a philosophical term, about this uh, apparent uh, rift between people who speak English and people who speak Spanish on these topics? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, epistemic injustice. Yes. Um, so, so, okay, epistemic injustice is a bigger concept than just language, right? Because, of course, it's a, it's, you know, you see it anytime there's like a, a in, in any area, there's a marginalized group that that their testimony is not properly heard. Um, that's one kind of epistemic injustice. Yeah, that's right. OK, uh, my question goes uh, in that lane, but I want to ask you, why do you think or do you think that it could be possible that the people in the American disclosure movement Hmm. don't want to pay attention to what's happening with the mummies because they want to tell their own side of the story. Do you think yeah. it's messing up with their uh, narrative? <laughs> um, uh, um, let me think about this. I, I just want to answer this carefully because I, I don't want to, I don't want to disparage anybody unnecessarily. Right. Like, okay. There are some, obstacles to people taking this seriously language barriers are very real like like now thankfully we have lots of resources that make language barriers a lot less serious like it's now possible you know youtube auto translates things um and those translations are pretty good now right although it's it's funny there's this word um isn't it armado which means made or create created but it keeps getting translated as armed yeah um, and so like if you see the auto translations of anything about the nazca mummies they're like are these armed mummies and yeah like, obviously they're not armed but um <laughs> uh but anyways um so so it's tricky if you don't read spanish uh or don't 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 uh can't understand spanish to watch an interview or read a text uh that that isn't translated for you so some of it is explained by just 
language barriers, right? Um, but I do think it's more than that, right? I, I, I do think there is a tendency for people, uh, look, if, if the head of forensics for the U.S. Navy said, hey, my job is forensics. I see dead bodies all the time. And I'm telling you that this thing is uh, the remains of a, of a living body. This thing was once alive. Then that would be taken much more seriously than Dr. Zalza Benita's testimony has been taken. Um, is some of that because of the language barrier? Sure. Is it all because of the language barrier? No. <laughs> um, it's because there is a level of um, credibility that he is seen to lack because he's Mexican, right? Like, uh, like I, I, I don't see a way around that conclusion, right? Um, if if he were if he were from uh, a a, a military, you know, if he if he worked for the Navy of any NATO country, um, then it's much more likely that he would be taken seriously. Yeah, that does seem. I mean, doesn't that just seem trans? Doesn't that just seem obvious that, like, because, um, because he's Mexican, he's not being taken seriously, not as seriously. Yeah, uh, I go through that uh, slightly. I prefer to be more positive about it because, yeah, um, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt, especially yeah. in this space. But I have noticed, and I gotta tell you, I have noticed some uh, reticence mm -hmm. against people who are not from the country. And it is a language barrier, yes, but it's also like an idiosyncrasies yeah. barrier, you know, and a cultural yeah. one. Yeah. And I think I don't think it's uh, necessarily um, on purpose they do it, but it's yeah. but it happens. It is happening. Yeah. yeah you're well, right. it, it's interesting, right? Like uh, this this gets us, and this is you know outside of my specific area of expertise, so I'll, I'll mention this a little bit, but like like contemporary discusses of race issues. Um, like, like, like when people talk about systemic racism, uh, and I know that like, especially in the American, American discourse about race is just really toxic and not productive. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, people push back and they're like, no, I'm not racist. Um, and there, there is a sense in which they are right. Right. Like, like old school, explicit racism, like that person cannot be as smart as this person because they're Mexican, right? Like that kind of racism is thankfully almost entirely dead, right? Yeah, it no longer like, exists, I don't think. Um, well, it it does, but like mostly on the fringes, right? Like it's 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 thankfully a fringe view that we've largely moved past, right? But what is left is this kind of really subconscious stuff right um so so some of the evidence that i have seen which convinces me that this is still very much a real problem is um the uh the um there's been a number of experiments that have been done about job res uh, resumes job applications um where where you put on literally exactly the same content formatted exactly the same way and the only thing you change about it is the name at the top and whether that name sounds like a british person or sounds like an african-american person or sounds like a mexican person just the name itself will have a measurable impact on how many how many calls they get about that job they've done this experiment many times right so so what is that um, I am perfectly comfortable using the word racism, but it is a different kind of racism, right? Because I guarantee if you sat down the person who picked up a thing and saw, um, uh, right, uh, Zalze Benitez on the top and then didn't call that person and instead called someone named Stephen Brown, <laughs> right? Um, uh, and you asked them like, hey, do you think that Mexican people have equal dignity and value and that they should be treated with love and respect and care, they would say, of course I do, right? Um, but there's still this like low level stuff that's kind of like, uh, so so here's how I put this when I, when I do talk about these issues with audiences, like ask yourself seriously, if you have two resumes and one of the names 
sounds more like the names of the people who you know and grew up with, and one name sounds different, you will have this tendency to go with the one that feels more familiar and comfortable to you, right? And the whole point of the discussion of this kind of institutional or system, systemic racism, this, this kind of leftover racism, is that it's not conscious, it's not explicit, it's very subconscious, but it still has a very real impact on the lives of the people who are being excluded. Does that not make sense? You're preaching to the choir because I've been a <laughs> sports journalist for 14 years and I yeah. recently just moved to this. I'm, I am still on the transition, but I've, I've worked for some of the biggest companies in the world, in Europe. Yeah. And whenever I've applied to American companies, ESPN and you name it, and for English positions, I've always been turned down, despite yeah. my resume, which is pretty yeah. extensive. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It is very real. I can tell you that it is very real. It's very, I think it's a, like it's measurably real. Right? Like yeah. pe people have done experiments and and can say it. So I, yeah, I know the discourse on race, especially in the United States, gets very very messy and complicated. But but I am I am perfectly willing to say. There is a type of racism at play here, not the not the worst, really gross, horrible kind, but this like leftover and therefore also really difficult to get rid of kind, right? Like, how do you help, you know, people like you have more opportunities when your name or your accent or whatever it is about you that that just sets off these like really low level that person is a little different from me and that makes me feel a little uncomfortable right like oh that's really hard to fix and and in fact from what i understand the only way to fix it is more points of contact right like um uh th there's very clear evidence that um that if you can just l get people to work around each other live each other make friends fall in love like those are the ways that we overcome this this other kind of racism, right? It, it's it's essentially making sure that the other doesn't feel other, feels feels like a friend, feels like someone who you can love and care about. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it is something that I've been experiencing over a yeah. year yeah, because sure. at the beginning it was very hard, but now that more people are getting to uh, speak to me and spend time with me and all that. Uh, more doors are opening and yeah it, you're right uh, it has to be gradual yeah 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 i mean it makes sense like there's this kind of low level human psychology thing right like go back to hunter gatherer times right like if if you're walking through the forest and and you see another being that looks human but really different from you they probably will try to kill you, right? So so if, if you have that, if it's like this really low level primitive kind of prehistoric um, defense instinct, then you could see how that would carry over into the modern world, right? Um, but but yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. And I do think it's present here uh, in the Nazca mummy case. Like, uh, like if, if you, I, one of the things that I, I, uh, uh, when I talk about this, like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know how much I'm going to try to cram into this talk I'm doing in a couple of weeks, but, um, I, I would be interested in, in kind of showing this, right? Like there's, um, uh, uh, the, the number of highly credentialed people in, in a whole variety of fields who have seen and touched these objects and have said they are not animal bones wrapped in paper, Right is is really high at this point and like really really qualified people hand surgeons um are looking at the hands right and and being like that looks like a real hand right um but it has too many bones in it or right? right so so yeah it, it's it's yeah I, I don't know i think we've said enough of, i mean I, i'm all willing to i've said enough okay so i am not uh because i've been struggling to find the perfect words to talk about this right because Anybody who is accused of anything will will not react well. You already know this. And I've been told by uh, some of my collaborators and friends that this matter should be dropped and just left alone. And I understand that. I kind of agree. I do think that it's, it's not the best way to uh, 
try to get to the truth and try to focus on the work and the cases. But you guys need to take into account how every single one of these scientists and investigators felt with the slander, with the hit pieces, with uh, questioning their reputations, questioning their careers. How would you feel if uh, your career was put in question? How would you feel if you were slandered for work you have been doing for almost a decade, if not more? How would you feel? Why is it that uh, people in America love to uh, police other people for stuff they say and they want accountability and all this stuff? They demand it. Why is it that there's a double standard there? I think there needs to be accountability for uh, what has been done to the Latin American scientific community for this case. They're not claiming, uh, well, other than Mr. Jaime Maussan, who does believe and keeps saying that these were alien mummies or non-human intelligence bodies, uh, that is not proven yet. Uh, all that these scientists are saying is that these bodies are real they belong to some kind of specimens or beings that at some point in this world walk the earth that is all they're not saying these are aliens they're not saying these are repti reptilians they're not saying any of that so please stop uh conflating one thing and the other please especially those who want to slander uh, people involved here that is not what they're saying and uh, Dr. Gary Nolan is a man of his word because he is one of the few people who has remained neutral and wants to look at all the data and that is the example that needs to be followed what Dr. Nolan is doing and I commend Dr. Nolan for that I commend Matt Fort for that I know that there have been efforts before uh, from other people, like, uh, for example, Mr. Ross Colthart, to investigate this case. I don't know if they are still going to do it. I don't know if there's going to be a, a News Nation special. But given that Matt Ford already took a crack at it, I wouldn't be surprised if Ross would tackle this and spoke to someone else other than Dr. O'Connor. I would love that. Because when... Mr. Coldheart first tried to do this. He tried to be very quiet about it, understandably. And the people from Mr. Jaime Mausan's team messed that up. Because they were the ones that were screaming racism and screaming uh, that it was unfair. And uh, being antagonistic against everybody from the English speaking community. And I don't think that's the way to go, honestly. Uh, I think that, yes, there needs to be retribution. There needs to be some calling out of the slandering that has been done. But I think it needs to happen in a diplomatic fashion. If you do it antagonistically, you're not going to get anywhere. People are going to turn their backs on you. If you res resort to ad hominem, if you call names, that's not going to work. So please sit down in a table with each other both sides talk it over if if one side needs an apology it doesn't cause you anything to apologize and accept you were wrong it costs nothing to have empathy really and i'm just going to repeat what i said in a post where dr nolan responded to me uh to those who have been ignoring this because of this slander from people who are relatively credible, uh, that have uh, taken upon themselves to call names and insult people, if you uh, are now paying attention, all I have to say is, welcome to the party. You're late. Did you bring beers and chips? I want to thank everybody for the support. I want to thank everybody who has been watching my videos. The comments have been great. Even the ones that are uh, criticism, they've been respectful. 
I've responded to them too. I love it. It makes me learn. If I make mistakes, I love it that people uh, call me out on it in a respectful manner. I love that. If you want to support what I do, please like, share, comment, subscribe. You can share on any other platform if you like. You can use the content I do. Just make sure you you uh, tag me or tag Psicoactivo Podcast. I really have no problems with that um, as long as you tag me because that's the way this has to go. That's how I get uh, more known to the people and that's the way that the channel grows. But if you feel like you want to support me in another way, uh, you can give me a super chat here. You can. Uh, I'm going to leave a PayPal account in the description. You can support me there. I've heard that uh, some people say it's in Spanish. I don't know what's the difference. I, I guess it's the same thing. You just have to press on, on donate. I don't know. But yeah. Let me know what you think about this. Um, this is the last video I'm going to do with this specific topic. Because it's. Uh, I know it's a touchy subject. But I do think that it needs to be talked about, especially with that double standard I told you that people in America are very keen on asking for uh, retribution or atonement or, you know, and I think it needs to go both ways. But I agree with Professor Brown. Uh, it's almost it is not intentional. The vast majority of this that happens, this epistemic injustice is not intentional. But it needs to change. People need to be aware of what they're doing. So it needs to change. Tell me if you agree or not. Tell me your thoughts in the comments. Uh, what do you think this topic is going to be like for the next year or so? Where do you think it's going to lead? Do you think the mommies are real? Uh, the, the, the desiccated bodies, sorry. Let us know in the comments. Without further ado... I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye.